Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to session six panel on leadership transition in China. I'm Dr. Bong Youngshik, a research fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. I'll be the moderator of this uh, panel. Uh, on yesterday, on the first day of Asan Plenum 2012, uh, we had three panels on China, uh, in which experts discussed whether China is prepared for a different kind of international leadership and how its exercise of global leadership will affect uh, its external policy, especially toward the uh, United States and the Korean Peninsula. In complement to the previous panels that provided insightful analysis of the current situations and innovative policy recommendations, this panel continues the dialogue on the main issues related to the leadership transition in China, its likely uh, trajectory, and its impact on China's external behavior in the near future. We are fortunate to have uh, four um, established uh, China experts in this panel uh, who will examine these issues from rich and diverse perspectives. On my immediate left, um, we have Dr. Kim hung professor at Songshin Women's University. Professor Kim served as a policy advisor to the Ministry of Defense, Naval Forces, Ministry of Strategy and Finance, and the National Unification Advisory Council. To his left, uh, we have Professor Soeya uh, Yoshihide, uh, Director of Institute of East Asian Studies at Keio University. He serves on the Board of Directors of the Japan Association of International Studies, serving as Editor-in-Chief of the Association's English Journal, International Relations of Asia Pacific. Third panelist is Professor Wang Yiwei, a uh, distinguished professor at Tongji University and also executive dean of the Institute of International and Public Affairs and director of the China-Europe Academic Network. Uh, he was formerly a diplomat at the Chinese mission to the European Union from 2008 to 2011. Last but not least, uh, we have Professor So Jongmin, uh, currently associate professor and uh, uh, chair of the Department of Political Science and International Studies at Yonsei University. Before joining the Yonsei University, uh, his alma mater, about a year ago, uh, he was an associate professor at uh, University of Hawaii. Um, so, aloha. <laughs> 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 we will stick to the uh, usual uh, format uh, of the panel. Uh, each speaker will make an opening statement for five to seven minutes. And uh, after uh, the round of initial statements, uh, we will have question and answer period. First, uh, let me turn to Professor Kim hung uh, with a question on, on continuity. I believe it's in everyone's mind that uh, what's going to happen in leadership transition in China after the uh, you know, Chongqing incident and the downfall of the downfall of the Boshi Lai. Before the accident, the overriding assumption was that the leadership transition uh, will be more of the same. So the continuity uh, was assumed as the de facto condition in leadership transition in China. But things seem to uh, begin to change. Could you share your thoughts on this? Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, wonderful you know, uh, opportunity. Um, Bushilai's incident is still in the process, so uh, uh, it hasn't yet uh, already been, uh, but it has already had a tremendous impact upon the Chinese core politics the, uh, and shattered the image of the harmony and the unity of Chinese leaders and their pursuit of consensus building, which is a critical component of the so-called uh, Chinese model. The incident made all uh, previous predictions uncertain. Uh, and uh, forced to re-examine the outlook of Chinese leadership uh, formation in the, 18th, in the 18th Party Congress. According to the uh, previous predictions, though they are very, uh, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang and uh, Li Yuanchao, uh, Wang Xishan, uh, 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 Liu Yishan and uh, Zhang Dezhang and Bo Xilai are highly likely in. 
but the others such as uh, Liu Yuandong, uh, Wei Zhongsheng, Wang Yang, and then uh, Zhang Gaori in the current Politburo would uh, compete for the rest uh, of the uh, rest two seats. However, due to the incident of a Bo Shilai, it becomes more difficult at the present moment to predict exact new members than are previously uh, anticipated. To understand the formation of the new leadership, uh, we must take into uh, account a subtle a combination of uh, unwritten but uh, cus customized norms, institutionalized rules, and also the uh, negotiation and compromise in the efforts of balancing among various factions. The finalization of leadership formation may uh, take time until the very moment before uh, 18th Party Congress holds. If consensus were not be reached, the opening of the 18th Party Congress could be uh, postponed. However, given the ability of Chinese leadership and their focus on the stability, necessity for unity, I mean, uh, is unlikely. Before the demise of Bo Xilai, it was highly likely uh, that the 18th uh, Politburo Standing Committee would be composed of two or three members from uh, Communist Youth League, uh, the so-called Tuanpai, four from uh, prince, uh, prince Lings, and three or two from Shanghai faction. Therefore, a rules coalition of prince, prince Lings and Shanghai faction would be still in majority of the Politburo Standing Committee, which is the most powerful decision-making organization, of course, in China, while the youth league uh, groups balancing them on the basis of its superiority in the uh, party, central party, central committee. However, after the incident, the landscape of the Chinese power politics at court has been tremendously changed. Although the final compromise has yet been, has yet been reached, the Politburo Standing Committee is likely composed of the uh, four or five members from Communist Youth League, and three or two from Prince Lings, and two or three from Shanghai factions. The loose uh, coalition between Prince Lings and Shanghai factions are torn apart in the middle of Bo Xilai's incident, uh, which also proves that the uh, unity of Prince Lings uh, was not sturdy. As a result, the balance of the Youth League groups and the loose coalition of uh, Prince Lings and Shanghai faction will certainly be changed in favor of the former, at the every level of power basis in the CCP. The uh, Youth League will be a dominant force in the uh, 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 Central Committee, Politburo, and the Politburo Standing Committees. In the 18th Party uh, Congress held in the, um, uh, 2012, a largest reshuffling is anticipated. 15 or 16 members out of 25 are likely to be replaced. In the Politburo Standing Committee, seven out of nine members will be uh, replaced. Let me uh, briefly uh, point out the kind of implications of the, uh, such a large uh, you know, reshufflings after the Boshila incident. First of all, coordination mechanism and unity among Chinese leaders at the top level likely to be uh, waned, although the current Chinese leadership is likely to get over the negative impact of a Bo Xilai incident sooner or later. The reasons are as follows. First, still there is a semi-institutionalized mechanism of elite selections are working. Second is, there is a fear of chaos uh, shared by the fourth generation's leaders as well as the fifth generation's of leaders. All of them uh, had a kind of experience of chaotic situation of the cultural revolution. They are sons of cultural revolutions. And also there is a consensus building practice in decision making working and collective leadership tradition and balancing behaviors among elites due to the learning from the Mao's period still working. The second implication is the, uh, political, uh, the political landscape is getting more diversified and hard to control. 
in the fifth generation, there will be no charismatic leader, no powerful leader. Xi Jinping's power base will be certainly uh, weakened. Coordination problems will increase. And the fifth generation of leadership will face a tremendous social, economic, and maybe nationalistic pressure. So um, there are tremendous of, uh, challenges ahead of them, but uh, there is a weakened leadership and also the uh, hard to have a kind of consensus buildings among the leaders. So this means that they will uh, relative focus on the domestic issues rather than the uh, foreign policy issues. So no, uh, I, I, I can imagine that there, I can anticipate that there will be no drastic change of foreign policy in the near future, um, focusing on their, their domestic uh, you know, um, uh, stability and also adjustment of their you know, uh, coordination, but adjustment of their uh, you know, different you know, interest and then also the uh, other conflicts. So um, uh, the future of the uh, fifth generation's leadership is not certain and then also the uh, you know, uh, tremendous challenges. So this is my uh, tantamount, uh, uh, just um, uh, uh, tantamount, you know, just, uh, just kind of uh, my assessment okay. at this moment. Right, thank, thank you so much for uh, your opening statement, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Kim. Uh, Professor Sue, uh, uh, the uh, thrust of the question remains the same. Uh, how, what can we make of the ongoing uh, leadership transition uh, surrounding with uh, increasing uh, level of uncertainties, uh, many of which uh, have not been properly uh, predicted or expected, especially as Professor Kim uh, mentioned that uh, the current uh, unstable condition might be the result of low degree of political institutionalization in the Chinese political system uh, in the absence of uh, solid uh, regular uh, process of um, leadership change. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, before starting, I would also like to sort of thank uh, the Asan Institute and its uh, uh, leaders mm -hmm. for inviting me to, to this very, very impressive, amazing, very expensive uh, <laughs> event. <laughs> and uh, uh, last year I was one of the participants and I'm, I'm so I'm more than happy to be invited as one of the uh, speakers. Uh, but my problem is uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily a specialist in domestic politics of China. And uh, so I, I thought, uh, what is the sort of, uh, uh, you know, your, your kind of hidden intention of involving me here? And uh, so maybe my role is to make the spectrum of discussions as wide as possible, following this very, very professional and uh, specialized uh, you know, views on the recent uh, developments. And uh, I saw the name of uh, 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 Ken Liebethal in the original uh, draft program, as well as uh, Professor Kim. We are, in fact, uh, Michigan uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mafia. Faction. And, okay. uh, <laughs> and uh, that was the biggest reason why I uh, courageously took the invitation to be on this panel. And uh, so my, my uh, knowledge on Chinese domestics is, is, is a bit old. Uh, I, at, at Michigan, I studied a little bit uh, under the guidance of uh, late Michael Oxenberg. And uh, Ken Lee Bethel came at about the time when I was leaving Michigan. And, uh, but, but anyway, uh, so I, I was thinking, uh, uh, first of all, uh, how one could uh, place uh, the recent uh, Chinese political uh, development in, in a bit uh, historical perspective. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, previously it was all about Mao Zedong. Uh, he was at the center of uh, evol dynamic you know, changes of Chinese uh, domestic politics as well as foreign policy for many years. And so if you compare uh, you know, Chinese politics at that time uh, to, to that today, 
tremendous evolution. And uh, there was a joke several years ago, or a little more, more uh, a longer time ago. Uh, if you know, Deng Xiaoping were reborn today, uh, he would have said, oh, this is not what I was uh, uh, about to come. Uh, I wanted to go to China, so you know, bring, me, bring me to China. And uh, when Mao Zedong was reborn, uh, he would have died of heart attack shortly, uh, immediately. So, uh, the, 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 you know, that joke was, uh, of course, interesting bec because of uh, the tremendous change, you know, happened since then. And, of course, leadership change is also, you know, equally uh, amazing. Uh, well, there was the mention of lack of uh, institutionalization, but, but if you compare Chinese uh, leadership structure and politics, uh, with uh, that of my country, Japan. It's highly institutionalized. And you even know central leaders before, you know, uh, they, they were formally uh, decided. And uh, the, the leadership is supposed to continue for 10 years. That's a recent, you know, uh, institutional uh, practice. And, but the point about whether that is going to be the case uh, this time for the fifth generation after the 18th party congress, that, that is a very big question. So I think that's one of the issues which uh, Dr. Kim raised and uh, uh, we, should, we should discuss. But uh, of course my sense is uh, I think Chinese leadership will muddle through uh, because you know, uh, one of the Fundamental reasons why uh, politics is messy, including in this case, I mean, uh, leadership transition in China, is of course uh, issues are very difficult for any leaders to handle. And 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 added to that, uh, in increasing complexity, is of course uh, this is where institutional arguments I think should be important. Uh, I think some some kind of institutional fatigue is. Uh, something which annoys almost every uh, political uh, system in, in the world. And, and in case of China, I think it's not an exception. And, uh, and how institutional fatigue is being uh, displayed and felt uh, in, in the process of Chinese political evolution, I think that's what uh, these specialists perhaps can, can say uh, authoritatively. And, uh, b but, you know, uh, so, so Mao's time, it's about himself. And of course, Zhao Wenlai played an important role, and Deng Xiaoping started the somewhat, somewhat new process. And but now it's it's it's, it's very much uh, contrasting to to those years in the sense that it's a, in a way a joint leadership, and you have to uh, muddle through consultation among top leaders, and Chinese uh, type of consensus may be necessary as a as a kind of tool to make things uh, keep going. And uh, so, so uh, for to doing that is terribly, terribly, terribly uh, uh, difficult. And I think that's all uh, happening to the Chinese leadership as well. And, uh, and the meaning of uh, 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 the Abo incident, again, I'm, I don't have any authoritative view, and, uh, but uh, this could be a combination of several factors. Uh, uh, this could be about well, I kind of hesitate to say this in loud voices, but uh, the kind of lust for uh, wealth uh, among uh, established leaders, and it could be about the lust for power, of course, and uh, it could be about uh, factional struggles, as uh, Dr. Kim mentioned, and perhaps combination of combination of several uh, different factors. Uh, but uh, what is really, uh, I think, key? To, to this uh, development is, I think, the regime stability of a sort of the Chinese leadership. Of course, for those who are challenged by whoever, uh, including you know, Bo Xilain in this case, this is a threat to their uh, power, of course. But I think uh, the real, real problem is, is, is just more general, which is uh, kind of uh, regime legitimacy, uh, stability of the communist leadership. So unless uh, the whoever in the, in the power position uh, handles uh, this, this uh, you know, problem uh, somewhat wisely, uh, this would lead to 
not only the kind of weakening power of a particular faction or leader, but to the weakening of the you know, ruling system uh, under the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, in, in general. And, uh, and so in that sense, uh, preca uh, precarious uh, prediction, or, or at least precarious prediction that we could, you know, we, uh, we will be able to make is, is, uh, is, is very much, very much correct. I mean, future, future is very much uncertain and increasingly more difficult. And the Chi Chinese politics may be becoming one of, one, of the, one, one of many others. But having said that, I think there are still elements which make Chinese leadership very much stable uh, because of the nature of you know, Chinese government. So mm -hmm. the balance between those two, so divergent you know, uh, factors uh, at work at the same time, but how to look at the balance between them is of course uh, beyond my capability, but uh, I think that could be, could be debated. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Professor Wang Yiwei. Um, there is a saying that uh, this time the um, leadership change in China is qualitatively different from the past uh, leadership ch transitions. Uh, what do you think of that assertion that this time things are really um, going through a tra uh, fundamental transformation? Thank you. And uh, uh, also you can thank uh, Asan Institute for very ex expensive <laughs> treatment <laughs> <laughs> before you start your statement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the 80 party con uh, uh, <coughs> Congress uh, matters not only uh, quantity but also quality. Quantity means 70%, 70 of the number one leader uh, in party, government, and the military will change. It's huge. Uh, but the quality uh, matters more. Means this is, a, uh, I think, it's a real post then era of the generation transition. It's not just a power transition. Why I mean the post of then uh, for two reasons. Number one is, you know, Deng Xiaoping choose his successor and his successor's successor, but not yet this time. So uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Li Keqiang, I think the run, I think it's uh, from the competition with the, the colleagues. I think the, this is, uh, we say, it's a, a intra uh, party democracy. Huh? because no one chose before. So I mm -hmm. think uh, it's happened. Uh, so some Bosch or other uh, incident happened. If under this uh, historic background, maybe understandable. So don't over explaining what is the meaning of the Bosch Lai cases. It's a real test, but the new generations can handle this power transition smoothly and uh, uh, most importantly, rule of law. Second meaning of the post then era, generation uh, transition is in, a, in recent 30 years of opening reform, the Deng Xiaoping guided the direction, open reform, integration with the international community. Uh, very few people doubt of that. But after 30 years, you know, especially after the, the global financial crisis, you know, the teachers made a mistake. Huh? Te the students, you know, how to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Some people said, it's not just China should open reform. In the US, you should also open reform. And <laughs> your political system, whatever, you know, European doesn't matter, you know, also. So there's a two uh, controversial uh, topic in today's Chinese media. Number one is about, the, uh, as I said, direction. Whether there's universal values or not, you know, some people said, our Chinese model, even <laughs> maybe uh, it, it seems works, and it works better than other models, uh, something like this. Even in a China model, there's a Chongqing model, Wang Yang model, with different models. And then most importantly, it's about the procedures, how to open reform. You know, some people said it's over uh, reform. Reform too much, open too much. Because after 30 years open reform, some people, some regions, some sectors of the uh, benefit more from the open reform. Some suffered, huh, felt more challenges from the open reform. So that different thing about the open reform. Uh, so, and the, also the, the priority of uh, reform, some people said social reform should uh, be first. Mm -hmm. And then political reform later. If you read the Global Times yesterday, uh, no, the, day, the day before yesterday, some people say, no, political reform should take the first step. So this is a kind of order, and uh, I think it is a very interesting to views of the Chinese uh, changing of the uh, atmosphere. They are thinking of the relations between China and the world and the open reform, <coughs> per se. And uh, of course, uh, opening, I think, is the consensus. That's the reason the Chinese top leaders you know, busy traveling uh, abroad recently. <laughs> so this is uh, sending signals 
continue the op uh, opening. But reform, uh, how to reform? Or oh, it's not uh, some people blame the today's Chinese difficulties, including the corruptions, all because of the reform or uh, opening, the different saying, I think. This is more important uh, to uh, witness. I think most importantly, there are five uh, levels of analysis of framework to through, uh, let us to understand about Chinese power transition. Number one is uh, power structure and uh, structural power. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. power structure, you know, this nine pow most powerful standing members, permanent. No one question about that. Some people say, that, okay, reduced to the seven, this used to be. But I doubt because the uh, individual power uh, is less powerful. I think this is a uh, long term. There's uh, no charismatic uh, leader like Mao. This is like a Bush I want to be. Uh, I don't think he can, can succeed. Huh? Structural power most important for the uh, uh, political meaning as a power stru uh, structural power that uh, uh, today uh, uh, Chinese uh, legitimacy of their power, not just based on the growth per se, huh? our growth slowing down, but uh, quality and the social uh, meaning most important, stability. And the economic uh, pow uh, structural power, you know, uh, Chinese uh, uh, engine for economic growth from the buy, uh, to trade, and FDI to uh, uh, three. And also the domestic demand also is another pillar of the economic growth. This matters a lot. In long term, well, China will be more focused on the domestic demand and then the change the relations between China and the world. Social structure power, I think is most important. Today, half of the Chinese people live in a city and a town. This is totally changed. You know, China is not a traditional agricultural society anymore. And most importantly, one third of the Chinese population, they are netizens. Huh? Especially Weibo, you know, you know <laughs> for uh, 100 million people use Weibo. So this has changed Chinese society. So grassroots awaken. I think it's more important to understand the Chinese future uh, of the change. Uh, this is a popular case that people mentioned about, you know, that Weibo plays an important role, huh? people say. Secondly, I think it's a, a power base and a basic power. Power base, you know, traditionally we are power base as the more uh, farmers uh, and the workers. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, I think the middle class, I think the half of the Chinese population sometimes identify as the middle class. Some people, it's different, di uh, depends on different definition, but the middle class, you know, is rising rapidly. So some people say that the Bush uh, make enemies with the middle class, so that's the reason he, he was removed. <laughs> so uh, the middle class, I think, uh, 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 growing is a um, matters group. So after 30 years of open reform, the, the vastest interest groups huh, growing. So that will make Chinese open reform more difficult because different people you know, have different things, the benefit uh, suffer differently, as I said before. And then number three is the power distribution and the distributing power. You know, uh, now uh, where's the where's, uh, dis uh, distribution also uh, impact of the power distribution. So I would like to uh, remind you about the nine most powerful uh, men, probably also women. <laughs> it's not just the, about the background of the Tuan Pai or you say the youth, but I think it's the division of labor more important. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, they are the how to handle the Chinese difficulties. I think the, the Bojilai case, most important signal sent is that the, uh, the past-oriented approach failed. What should I want to use the, like a mouse, you know, uh, way of, you know, distribution of the wealth or uh, to say the red song or whatever cannot solve our today's problem. So we people say that Nasatelia, huh? this is cannot uh, solve our problem. We should have the future-oriented thinking to handle over our difficulties. You know, we have many uh, challenges domestically and internationally, but not to seek the answer from Mao, but from the future to uh, mm -hmm. cope with the current challenges. This is, I think, <coughs> this is a, a budgetized case uh, sent a signal to us. Number four is a power uh, uh, institution and institutional power. Uh, budgetized case also uh, means that collective leadership is more important than individual uh, powerful uh, 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 phenomena like before. I think uh, today, I think, um, the institutional uh, lies of a power transition and the power structure is most of the challenge for China. That's the reason I think uh, um, how to, uh, that's the reason that uh, Pema Wen warned that, that the Cultural Revolution, you know, uh, also uh, have some dangers. And because I think uh, the rule of law and the 
transition of the uh, distribution of power should according to the uh, based okay. on the rule of law. This is, I think, is a, is a challenge for, 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 the, for the future. And, then, and lastly, uh, not necessarily, I think the power mentality or ideology and ideology power. I uh, means this is new generations. They're grown up uh, during the Cultural Revolution. They're working experience based on the open reform. So sometimes it's contradicted for them. They are very, very much about the difficulties of the uh, Cultural Revolution and uh, so including uh, Xi Jinping work nine years in the in 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 countryside. I think this is uh, uh, impact of his mentality uh, 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 very much. Communicate with the local people and uh, live in the farmers. Uh. So they the, the want to, uh, I think, after the Bojla case, uh, Communist Party should do more PR to, uh, to, to, to improve the image. <coughs> I think mm. this is uh, a good signal to, uh, to for the Chinese uh, top leaders want to show the collective leadership uh, to the consensus. And uh, not just uh, let others, you know, see, we say the scandal, uh, you know, is, uh, is uh, uh, happened before. So the mentality, I think this is new generation's mentality, not, not only based on their individual working experience, uh, but also I think the most importantly to, uh, according to their, how to handle their difficulties, the, way, uh, the division of labor, I think is the most important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Sun. Uh, it seems like that not only the new generation of leaders uh, have to deal with challenges, domestic and international, but at the same time, they might try to define the rules of the game as an attempt to broaden the purview of, of their political freedom for better uh, to become more able to deal with those challenges. Could you identify the major challenges to the uh, emerging leaders and how you think they will try to cope with them? Well, it seems uh, you gave a <laughs> changed the questions, I think, right? Right. Uh, actually, I got, I got uh, the question regarding Bush <laughs> Right. And then, okay, that's nice. <laughs> 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 it's a nice exam, all right. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> First of all, it's, it's very interesting to see what's happening in, in China these days. Mm -hmm. And then uh, all three uh, earlier, panelists you know, mentioned about this changing leadership or the possibility of change, but it seems they all agree that we should not overestimate you know, this you know, report regarding uh, Bojilai or just you know, fissure of the Chinese elites or etc. So we assume that they are just maintaining quite, you know, relatively quite stable leadership so far, and then we expect uh, the same thing. But uh, it's very difficult, you know, we have some, you know, analysis, we have quite many analysis of this, the characteristics and nature of the fifth generations and they are more uh, low and social science oriented, they are more, you know, you know very well trained in market economy and etc. compared to the earlier generations. So we have just, you know, pretty good demographic, you know, analysis, but we can see who, you know, as uh, Professor Wang said, you know, it's now China, you know, CCP, the uh, center of CCP is not simply appointing the inheritor, you know, by the will of one leader. So it's, you know, we can see that there is uh, some consensus, there is a uh, intra-party uh, democracy is working at least in the central committee level. So if that's the case, uh, who will be the leader, you know, inheritor of Xi Jinping or next, you know, you know f 10 years later or 15 years later, that all depends on what kinds of challenges, you know, Chinese leadership will face in the next 10 years. That will be, you know, some outline of my uh, comments. Let's first see, you know, what kinds of challenges they have, you know, definitely, I absolutely agree that in domestic way, you know, this, how to manage or how at least uh, how to make sure you know, make sure that CCP is look like a coherent entity from Chinese population. You know, Chinese population, because they have a pretty uh, tough lesson in 1989, that when leadership looked this split, then you know, society or people will exploit the opportunity. And then that is so-called post-Tiananmen system that uh, on the top level or at least the central committee level, you know, 
they actually, you know, they definitely hide or conceal any internal divisions. And then, you know, this bourgeois case actually indicates that they're, you know, the top leaders are not necessarily harmonious, you know, that much. And then there is a, some conflict. There is a, some, but you know, uh, you know, using corruption as a political, you know, suppressing corruption as a political tool, I actually see it as quite in, in a positive perspective. Because even in democratic society, you know, pointing out or finding corruption case of the oppositional party or you know, the ruling party is one of the best political strategies. And then I, I, I don't think anything strange in China. But <coughs> so in that way, you know, China, uh, Chinese leadership their, you know, their uh, internal split has been exposed to, to some extent. But the difference between 1989 and 19, uh, two, 2012 is, in 1989, there was uh, almost a million Chinese students who were on Tiananmen Square with a quite coherent identity. Now, we, we cannot really find uh, coherent protesting groups in China. So that, then there might be opportunity, but there is no group who can exploit that chance. Mm -hmm. So CCP is quite lucky at this time. So that's how uh, I see relative, you know, optimistic regarding the stability of CCP. But let me go further with uh, in a more structural or bigger issue of the challenge to Chinese leadership in the next 10 years. First of all, you know, it's economy. It's all about economy. I had a just very interesting chat, chat with my uh, Chinese students this morning and then you know, have you heard about Bujilai, you know, case? And then it seems uh, actually her father called her, you know, in Korea, in Seoul, that because her, car her father was curious about that incident and then he could not find, you know, any appropriate report. And then, you know, <laughs> that, that Chinese students in Seoul actually explained about what happened in China. But so I asked the father, so, you know, is there any public interest in that case. And then there's uh, some interest in on the level of gossip mm -hmm. rather than any uh, serious political one. And everyone's just worrying about finding a job and then you know, uh, this year's business rather than you know, whether political corruption in Chongqing or not or the issue on the matters of the top leaders. So that I think that economy still is the, uh, the most important uh, issues. And this, the gap between rich and poor, you know, the Chinese Gini coefficient is, you know, just almost the same as the United States. And Chinese economic growth since 1980s you know, has very unique characteristics in a sense that Chinese economic growth has just advanced on the parallel with the process of globalization. So that is somewhat uh, compared to South Korea or Taiwan's 1960s or 70s, their uh, Gini coefficient you know, is maybe the worst of any developing countries you know, in, from you know, historical comparison. So that will be a huge burden for China, you know, CCP top leaders uh, for a long time. And also the, the society, the challenge is this, you know, more than uh, 200 million uh, migrant workers who are so-called you know. That is not necessarily the issue of rich and poor. That's the issue of citizenship. That those Chinese migrant workers living in urban cities who does not enjoy the full citizenal rights. You know, that will eventually create uh, some problems, I guess. And then ideology, as uh, some of you, you know, the panelists mentioned, this, uh, the new generation, how you know, they are, they are not necessarily hardcore communists, they are not necessarily hardcore Democrats, right? But there should be some guiding principle regarding what kinds of society China is heading toward, and then Chongqing model definitely failed. And then is there any alternative model? You know, it seems going back to uh, 1960s, stupid is already proven, but is there any alternatives? And then the nationalism is coming out and gaining strength, and but you know, CCP is well aware of the fact that uh, nationalism cannot be easily tamed. So what kinds of uh, public ideology, you know, official ideology China, CCP has to use that's, uh, you know, still yet to be uh, solved. 
And also there's a global challenges. Global challenge is ironically because of Chinese newly obtained position. It's a G2 position. And then, but you know, also it's a reality that China is a junior partner of the United States, not necessarily you know, China is, will be a hegemonic power in next 20 or 30 years. So as a junior partner, but still has in the position of G2, you know, now China has a huge responsibility in, in globally, such as the issue of six paritok or North Korean nuclear weapons, or including the uh, conflicts in Sudan or terrorism in Central Asia. Now, you know, all the world is watching, you know, the role of China. What 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 would be Chinese policy toward that? So they, well, there is an interesting, <coughs> actually, joke in China that uh, in 1949. Uh, communism saved China. 1989, China saved communism. 1989, uh, 1989, 1979, capitalism saved China. Ni 2009, China saved capitalism. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> now it, it's Chinese position. Now you know, with more than a trillion uh, U.S. treasure bond, now you know Chinese eco economic involvement in global you know, level is so critical to the well, you know, the health of global economy. So China, China should play that role. And then whether Chinese leadership has that capacity or capability or will is our critical concern, you know, and uh, we have to look into, you know, we have to observe it very closely. So the mission of CCP, uh, including Xi Jinping or his successor, is pretty simple. Uh, first, they have to maintain high-speed economic growth. That is a very difficult job. After 30 years, is there any still the room for growth that's of double-digit you know, increasing? Actually, the uh, labor structure or industrial structure of China is not exactly the same as uh, 1990s South Korea or 1970s and 80s Japan. For instance, uh, China, Chinese economy has uh, after 30 years of industrialization still, you know, it's the highest portion of uh, second uh, sector, you know, manufacturing sector is unusually big compared to 1980s or 90s Korea or 1970s Japan. That is because of the effect of globalization, right? So China is playing as the uh, factory of the globe. Then, you know, actually that somehow hamper the normal or healthy growth of Chinese economy, or actually the, uh, the room for further growth is actually uh, narrowing down. And then, so Chinese leaders should find uh, another alternative strategy, how to maintain double-digit growth. Otherwise, you know, that is the legacy of Jiang Zemin, right? Jiang Zemin's this high-speed economic growth definitely, definitely gave the legitimacy to CCP. Now, Xi Jinping still had to do, do the same but at the same time, they have to finish this uh, unfinished mission of Hu Jintao, that is harmonious society, that is uh, reducing the gap between rich and poor, re reducing the gap between rural and urban China. And this new leadership will inherit those two missions together. And then if they fail in any of them, then for instance, they fail to keep up with uh, double digit economic growth, they will lose middle class or intellectual as the supporting, you know, or if they fail to uh, finish this incomplete uh, mission of Hu Jintao, then they will lose peasants and workers. They will, insta you know, they will face a destabilized society. So that is very uh, complex missions uh, now they're facing. And also they have to find alternative ideology, definitely. And then finally, they have to find, you know, the legitimacy of how to uh, prolong the legitimacy of CCP. You know, because the earlier Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao, you know, their power base was relatively simple, and then their ideology was relatively simple, their slogan was simple. This new leadership will not, you know, they cannot use that simple slogan, such as harmonious society or get rich is glorious. You know, now the slogan got much more complex, and they have to still satisfy all those 1.3 populations. That is, <coughs> there are uh, very difficult missions. But so 
Now, in the long term, we can see the Chinese leadership will face tremendous challenges, you know, and they have a huge missions. But today, you know, we when we see you know in, in, in micro level, we haven't seen uh, any you know concrete uh, evidence that they are really collapsing or their uh, power structure is radically changing. But who knows? You know, in the spring of 1989, no one really predicted. You know the Tiananmen Square incident, so or even 1991 and two, no one really predicted the sudden collapse of Soviet Union. We don't know yet, but we don't have concrete evidence right now. That that would be my observation. All right, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Kim. You have yeah, uh, something. Um, uh, when we start uh, talking about China, and uh, China is too big and uh, too uh, you know defined. So uh, we are talking about the world affairs and uh, so many things in China. So, uh, but uh, let me return to the our original subject to uh, you know the uh, Chinese uh, leadership transition. Um, I think the uh, Bushla incident uh, at glance uh, it caused lots of trouble. And also the uh, shattered the image of Chinese, you know, consensus buildings and the unity, and uh, uh, may it may uh, you know uh, draw a kind of conclusion uh, in the near future. Chinese political system may have uh, some uh, trouble. However, in, uh, if we have a kind of a mid uh, you know terms perspective, I think it has a kind of stabilizing effect. You know, Bo Xilai was a kind of a revolutionary in terms of the Chinese decision-making you know, system and then also the uh, selection of the top elites. Generally speaking, they, fo uh, they had a kind of uh, norms uh, with uh, kind of uh, consensus buildings and then also the uh, uh, you know, uh, coordinations and compromise among you know, current leaders and the elders. But Boshila, when uh, Boshila was uh, appointed as uh, uh, Chongqing's the, uh, you know, party secretary, he was actually almost out, and uh, almost impossible to be uh, uh, you know, uh, a Politburo standing committee member. But uh, he had a really smart and wonderful tactic. And uh, Boshila was originally the, uh, you know, uh, specialized in the economy areas. Okay. But in the economy area, there are two big uh, you know, giants. Uh, Li Keqiang and also the uh, uh, Wang Qichang. So uh, if we understand the Chinese uh, elite selection uh, you know, process and uh, there was a kind of division of labor and also the respect of kind of uh, you know, professionalism. So uh, there is no chance for the Boshilai to get in in the area of the uh, economy and to take the kind of seat uh, you know, guaranteed for, uh, in the uh, Politburo Standing Committee. So. His tactic was to, to target the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, public security and also the uh, you know, uh, uh, surveillance that those areas. <coughs> so he was almost successful, and, but his tactic was quite dangerous for Chinese the, you know, leaders because he mobilized uh, populist you know, tactics and attacking from outside with, instead of uh, from, uh, coming uh, within party. So, uh, and also the, uh, if you understand the uh, Chinese age, you know, uh, norms in uh, selecting the uh, uh, Politburo Standing Committee, he has no chance to be a fifth uh, generation of leaders because of his age. You know, there is a rule of qi shang fa xia, means the, uh, when you become a uh, Politburo Standing Committee, your age must not exceed uh, 67, but he was born in uh, uh, 1949. So uh, when he became a, a leader in the uh, uh, 19th Party Congress, and then uh, he exceeded the uh, 67, he became a 68. So if you understand the you know the norms and also the rules of selection in the Chinese uh, list. He has uh, no chance, so that's why he mobilized the uh, you know populist mm -hmm. tactics as well as the uh, he targeted a certain point means the uh, the public security. Public security job is the uh, to invest the kind of uh, corruptions and all kinds of the uh, uh, Chinese elites the uh, problems inside outside. Mm -hmm. So if he took that kind, he take the, took the kind of position, and then he has 
a kind of uh, a weapons to attack the other you know, top leaders. So he has ambition. He has a good at the mobilizing the uh, populace. And then also the, uh, you know, uh, he has a kind of weapons to attack them. But it caused lots of trouble for the Chinese the, uh, you know, leaders. So uh, uh, I think when uh, Wang Yujin uh, case was the, uh, just uh, you know, popped up, and then I really felt, and then this is the, uh, over the bush line, is, there is no chance for him to uh, you know, survive. So, oh, yeah. uh, All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. With the opening statements, um, um, we have already uh, found many uh, counterintuitive um, um, you know, um, arguments or a different way of analyzing the current situation in China with the leadership transition, that uh, uh, the uh, leadership transition system in China um, is more institutionalized than that in Japan, and the uh, 67 is too old for uh, important position, and the situation in uh, 20, uh, 2012 is not the same as the uh, situation in 1989 uh, with the Tian Tiananmen uh, Square incident. Um, with, that, with those uh, uh, points in mind, I'd like to open up uh, the floor for question and answer. Yes, sir. Uh, Simon Long from the, the Economist. It's one way in which this transition seems to me unprecedented is the way the outside world, the West, has been embroiled, uh, first through Wang Yijun's visit to the consulate in Chengdu, and now the alleged, um, the, or, or Bo's wife's alleged role in the, in the murder of a Briton. And I just wondered how that factor is likely to play into the, the process. Anyone would like to take up the question? You wait. Yes, I think, uh, very good question. I think the top leaders, including ordinary Chinese, angry, so angry for the Wang Lijun case, uh, scandal is because uh, we automatically invite United States, including U uh, uh, United Kingdom, to interfere our domestic affairs. This uh, should be avoided. I know. I think this uh, we say the Jiaozhu uh, Bukawai Yang, the home uh, scandal cannot be shown to the outside. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a uh, this this is uh, terrible. I think um, make the the, the Bochila case more uh, serious. And, uh, mm -hmm. But I would like to say that. Uh, don't over explaining the Bosch Lai case mm -hmm. with the power transition, uh, generation transition. Even Bosch Lai case, you mentioned about the fail of the Chongqing model. I don't know, Chongqing model not just uh, connected with the Bosch Lai uh, uh, individually. Uh, you know, Chongqing model, the three pillars. Number one is uh, anti mafia campaign. Number two is a red song, you know, uh, ideology. <laughs> Number three, most important way people say, is uh, urbanization of the farmer workers. Mm -hmm. That the farmer workers can buy uh, the real estate in the city and it also keep the land in the countryside. This is kind of quite, some people say, quite successful in doing so. Of course, it's not a project, but also Wang Qifan and other mm -hmm. uh, t together. So, but the problem is, Chongqing model maybe in the third pillar works, but it cannot work for the whole China. Mm -hmm. China is too big if you want to over explain the Chongqing model and then make another mistake. So that, that's the maybe it's a difficulty to solve that. Right, thank you. Professor? Clement Henry, American University in Cairo. Um, I'm very interested in this discussion of internal party democracy, institutionalization of procedures. These are the kinds of things that Sam Huntington and I, once upon a time, uh, we're writing about concerning the evolution of single party systems. Uh, how do you uh, sort of keep an established party going? The succession crisis has always sort of been the key and one which apparently, I mean, the bow crisis even sort of underlines this. There are procedures. Uh, there are factions factions which gain support through finance. There may be some corruption involved, okay, but the point is there are these procedures. Why can there not be greater transparency in the interests of consolidating the evolution of this established party? 
and thus being in a position perhaps to respond more effectively to some of the challenges that the last speaker uh, uh, pointed out. Thank you. I think the question is directly uh, directed to um, last well, two speakers. <coughs> okay. Uh, in 1989, you know, the, including New York Times or BBC, many Western reporters actually asked those are student, student protesters. They, you're, you're just uh, uh, raising the issue. Your, your students actually uh, shouting for uh, democracy. And so do you support uh, giving the voting rights to all Chinese people? And their answer was very simple. No. <laughs> Definitely not. We cannot give any voting rights to ignorant farmers and peasants. So. Transparent and then you know, building the uh, democratic basis, if that means you know, the penetrating democratic decision-making process in rural or, or you know, the ordinary populations, then they will alienate mil middle class or intellectuals, etc. That is, you know, so that why they are not democratizing their party institutions, then you know, many Chinese would say that you know, it's too early, you know, not yet. Maybe, but maybe you are right. 10 years later, 20 years later, what if the interest of Nong Ming Gong, you know, the migrant workers, interest of uh, urban middle class and intellectuals and farmers, if their interests are so conflictual to each other, then there is no way the party can you know, choose any one policy over the, an the other. Then maybe the, par the party can you know, secure the legitimacy only through the method of elections. Then maybe that gives the policy of you know, the party as, as a legitimate. That might be a possibility. Not in 10 years, I would say, but definitely in 20 or 30 years you know, range, then that might occur. But I don't think any uh, serious number of people in China feel that as a necessary you know, demands or necessary requirement for uh, their everyday life. And then they just might be pretty happy to see that the power struggle on the top level is pretty well concealed from the ordinary populations so that they can just con concentrate on their everyday businesses. That, that, was my, that is my impression of observing China today. Okay. Uh, um, let us turn to Professor Sway. Yeah, on, on this uh, right. point. Uh, I think there are two fundamental inconsistencies uh, or contradictions uh, on this democratization thing. Uh, one is uh, internal democratization within the power structure, party structure, is for the sake of maintaining one party rule. Mm -hmm. I think fundamentally contradictory. <laughs> and uh, and how, how long and how party leadership will able to manage this you know, inconsistency for, for many years to come. Uh, that's a big question, I think. Uh, uh, but well, I'm not predicting anything, of course. I think Chinese leadership may turn out to be more resilient. That has been the past history. So I don't know where it, it, it is heading. But having said that, I think consistency will never go away uh, as long as they keep you know, doing this. And secondly, uh, it's, it's much in a macro context. Uh, Current Chinese economic prosperity and economic development in coming years, I think every Chinese would agree, rest upon the political stability, the stability of the authoritarian regime. And uh, so this is another, another, I think, fundamental inconsistency. And uh, so, so I, I, might, I might have uh, stimulated my colleague here. Okay, uh, Professor, <laughs> Professor Wang first, then uh, we'll turn I to I uh, agree with you. <laughs> 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 first, uh, uh, yeah. internal democracy is a global trend. You know, Arbor Spring, whatever happened. That's the time when mentioned this also you know, uh, during his visit to uh, Saudi Arabia in, uh, in January. So uh, the, the voices from the grassroots should be heard, should be expressed in the political transition. I think that the, the most of the challenge for China, as I said, is the political structure, how to reflect the social and economic structure. This is more important, not just the one party, you say. Uh, I think that even the one party, the different people represent the different the voices. Otherwise, how can the Communist Party uh, keep the 
legitimacy uh, continue to be play the leading role. And also, you mentioned about legitimacy. Some people say, oh, legitimacy of the Communist Party rely on the economic growth. But you said legitimacy rely on the stability. So everybody said different things. Mm -hmm. So the precondition is Communist Party without enough legitimacy. That's the, your mentality. No, all the legitimacy, as I said, originally from the reality. Huh? Who can solve today's Chinese problem? The Communist Party can solve Chinese problem, like make China independent, make China prosperity. Today, who can solve the today's Chinese problem? Also the Communist Party, but in different approach. As I said before, in a recent 30 years, open reform, we don't know, you know, economic reform, cross the river by touching the stone. But today the river is too deep, the stone is too small. Huh? So the political reform, it just uh, uh, began. So what should I say has happened? This is, this is normal in this, uh, you know, historic trend. I think so, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, from the, your mentality or your keywords, like a Gini uh, index, or whatever to describe what Chinese mm -hmm. uh, huge transition is this, uh, I think, is more important. Professor Kim? Uh, I yeah. don't think uh, we are saying different things. Okay, always. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, always <laughs> keep the difference. Yeah. Um, I think the Chinese leadership also recognized the necessity for, uh, you know, political reform and then also the, uh, you know, uh, much uh, transparent the system and uh, to uh, transform their uh, total, their economy and to the totally different level. And then they are facing that kind of challenge. But the problem is they uh, realistically, their, the, uh, you know, current political, uh, you know, situations, there are coalitions among, uh, you know, uh, several different interest groups and factions. But uh, uh, oh, some of them, especially the uh, Shanghai uh, you know, groups, and also maybe uh, uh, princely, princelings, have uh, serious problems actually. Uh, it's impossible for them to be transparent. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I, that's, that's because the, the, the they had uh, so many interest related uh, kind of uh, you know issues and then also the corruption problems and then also they deal with generally speaking finance and the economy and the business that kind of and then also maybe license issuing businesses okay uh, but uh, so I think for short term okay perspective okay the uh, ninth position of the uh, uh, Political Bureau uh, Standing Committee will be the battleground between or among uh, interest groups or factions. Because the, uh, that position will deal with the corruption issues and then all other you know, uh, internal securities and maybe this kind of. So uh, uh, this is the one point I uh, really try to uh, see the uh, outcome. Okay. Uh, but uh, in the longer term, China will face the uh, totally different, you know, political environments and then also economic and social environment. Especially around uh, 2015, they will face tremendous social economic problems as well as the, uh, uh, you know, uh, upgrading their economy to the, you know, uh, 10,000 per capita, the level of, you know, economy. So without political reform, it's impossible to, you know, uh, change their the uh, current economic system to, the to, uh, to a, a different level. And also, uh, 2017, there will be a 19th Party Congress in which the Xi Jinping or fifth generation really uh, you know, uh, will uh, you know, try to get their own power, uh, getting out of the, uh, you know, uh, the shadow of the Hu Jintao or you know, the elders. At that moment, I think the uh, Fifth generation, the whether fifth generation really can uh, you know maintain unity or some consensus building process is questionable. Uh, so uh, uh, we are just uh, facing a kind of uh, a period of uh, maybe turbulence in some sense. Okay, uh, quite which is quite different from the past. So this is my uh, basic uh, you know um, estimation assumption. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Kim, microphone is coming. A you know, second ago, Dr. Kim touched the issue I wanted to raise. Um, what can be uh, Hu Jintao's future role after leadership change? And additionally, I wonder about the new leadership's vision for um, economic solutions, uh, particularly in the situation that 
uh, Chinese provinces uh, financial debt increases. I do not think the Hu Jintao is an expert in dealing with the economy. And then, but, uh, okay, uh, this is a question to the uh, second. Okay, and then, but uh, Li Keqiang's capability in dealing uh, with the economy is still questionable. And so uh, he needs uh, some uh, expert like uh, Wang Qishan. And also, the, uh, I'm not sure whether still, even though uh, Chinese leadership were aware of the kind of uh, challenges and difficulties, but uh, still, uh, whether they can deal with the, this kind of cope with this kind of issues, where uh, it's totally different, you know, question. So uh, I'm not sure at this moment, and because mm -hmm. their uh, the challenges they face are uh, so tremendous at this moment, uh, never, never, ex uh, you know, experienced actually uh, mm -hmm. before. So um, this is the uh, question, uh, answer to the second question. The first one is the uh, uh, Hu Jintao may. After the abortion law incident, the, uh, uh, the youth league will be a dominant, you know, uh, uh, power in the party at the, uh, you know, central committee, Politburo, Politburo standing committees. So uh, we can maybe imagine that uh, Hu Jintao may uh, be able to establish a kind of authoritarian or dictator image because he's dominant. He became dominant. It's quite different from the landscape of the, uh, you know, uh, past, you know, uh, fourth generations or third generations. There was a kind of collective leadership, and, uh, but, but uh, uh, my uh, you know, uh, guesswork is the uh, Hu Jintao is not likely to be, because, because of the several reasons I mentioned, the semi-institutionalized and also the traditions and the experience of the Mao's period and the kind of, so uh, rebalancing behavior among over, uh, you know, activities among uh, elites will start. And then uh, they will check the uh, you know uh, you know ob excessive power of the Hu Jintao. This is the, my uh, you know guesswork. And then, but still, Hu Jintao may take uh, 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 the chairmanship of the uh, Central Military Commission, like uh, the Zhang Jiamin, maybe two or three years. And then, so still, uh, uh, you know, uh, cast kind of his influence over the uh, Chinese military, and then uh, eventually the Chinese uh, politics process. And then because the uh, still. Uh, Chinese, uh, you know, uh, uh, future is uh, still, I, I think, uh, uncertain. And then also they feel really uh, unstable. And then, uh, so uh, Hu Jintao may uh, take a certain reason, like Zhang Zemin. Zhang Zemin, uh, you know, got the reason, and uh, there was a kind of unstable situation in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, that's why he needed to control the uh, military. <coughs> so uh, uh, took the uh, maybe two or three years the uh, you know position and uh, but Hu Jintao may have uh, that kind of and then uh, now uh, in uh, terms of the uh, Hu Jintao's influence and power and uh, he has enough you know reason to be okay. this the, is the thank you the leadership of Azan Institute uh, stipulates that you never compromise your time for dinner so <laughs> in the interest of time, um, I'd like to just uh, collect uh, two questions and uh, allow the uh, panelists to answer uh, any of the two uh, questions. Yes, sir. Christopher Clark, independent analyst and consultant. Um, I think this uh, last question raised a larger issue, which is the issue of the elders. Uh, we were very impressed in the early 1980s that China seemed to be moving in a more institutionalized uh, succession pattern and were th then very much disabused of that idea in 1989 when the elders stepped back in and took over power. Uh, clearly this is not 1989, but there has been a lot of discussion in the press about whether Jiang Zemin continues to play a role in shaping the new leadership, whether he played a role in the Bo Xilai incident in terms of uh, making the final decision to remove him or, or whatever the disposition of his case may become. So I wonder if our panelists might want to comment on the role of past leaders and their uh, continuing influence over current policy once the transition takes place. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. I uh, see there were actually three uh, transitions, leadership transitions in China this year. One was in Taiwan through universal suffrage. A second in Hong Kong with a managed election, but which sort of had an election campaign between the candidates and where the popularity of the candidates sort of 
played a role. And then we have the third transition coming up with uh, much less of, let's say, popular debate about what the candidates stand for. So my question would be, is, is, is that something like a sequence that one can expect to, that China was going to go through? I mean, mainland China is going to go through. Is there some model in there of the two other elections? Because the Chinese people seem to have watched the two elections in Hong Kong and Taiwan with a lot of interest and maybe asking themselves, well, why don't we have people who are telling us what they stand for and see how they are uh, uh, actually chosen on what kind of merit instead of so simply uh, belonging to some sort of obscure factions which are probably more imagined than reality. So what, what, what holds the future? All right, thank you. Um, Professor Kim, would you like to uh, answer one of the two questions? Uh, okay. Um, uh, there is a norm. If uh, uh, you retire, and then uh, you'd better not to intervene via, you know, politics. This is a kind of norm. But uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, norm, uh, you know, formal and the informal channels for the elders to, you know, put place his inputs in the policy-making uh, process. And then also, the if uh, an uh, elder, uh, you know, politician really made a kind of decision at his own risk, uh, he's going to raise, uh, you know, a kind of. Uh, uh, certain issues uh, publicly or uh, or uh, you know privately, then uh, Chinese leaders must uh, pay a certain respect uh, because Chinese system is very complicated and they don't want to make any you know clear cut you know decisions. If there is a kind of uh, uh, disputes and also different ideas, it's better uh, to postpone instead of making decision. This is a kind of decision making law. Thank you, Professor Swain. Uh, yes, I just respond to the second question. Uh, I think uh, yeah, when I said when uh, Dr. Wang uh, tried to contradict me, uh, when I said we are not saying different things, uh, uh, I think what he said are actually happening, and which is not contrary to what I wanted to say. So that's what I meant. But anyway, I think that's because I think there are s whole kinds of you know pressures uh, push moving China in the direction. I don't know whether it's Taiwan model or anything, but you know, so toward so-called democratization and the pluralization of society and democratization of you know, politics and all kinds of pressures are, I think, there. And, uh, but but uh, for China to continue to deal with it is, of course, a complex task. And, uh, and there, there is a basic contradiction. That's what I just wanted to point out. And, uh, but but uh, maybe, maybe uh, well, okay, yeah, because we don't have time, just uh, jump to the second point, related point, that is, uh, why that's happening? I think that's that's largely because of you know uh, globalization and the interna uh, internationalization of Chinese experiences, and uh, so which is another inevitable trend. And so so, but one thing which I would worry, but eventually this will be somewhat managed, is there is kind of uh, kind of reactionary or. Uh, kind of uh, this may be kind of nationalism, but because of external you know, exposure, these, these drives are actually there, but uh, there is kind of division, in my view, uh, in, in the Chinese society in ways of responding to those. I think one is, of course, uh, proactively you know, taking advantage of those external elements and uh, driving, steering the future of China in that direction, and the other is somewhat nationalistic reaction to those external pressures and uh, China being victimized or China being pushed around or th that kind of sentiment. And how those mixed sentiments among the Chinese you know, population would eventually you know, uh, evolve and affect future direction of China. Again, that's another big <laughs> issue, but uh, uh, of course I don't have any answer to that. But those will continue to present, I think, a series of uh, problems for the Chinese leadership, and uh, which is not an easy task at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, China might muddle through, that's, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Wang? I think uh, for the three questions, number one is about uh, what's impact of Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan's election. Yes, you know, one child policy. Uh, I got the news uh, uh, from my students when the f uh, election uh, finished in Taiwan. Th they are quite excited to talk about that. You know, uh, uh, obviously the leader, you know, uh, respect the result. Of the I think this is impact of chi uh, the new generation. So I think the grassroots, one child, one child, now is uh, more taking power. Uh, no. 
in the future, I think the more important uh, they are, the mentality may be different with all generation even. Uh, about the local, uh, about the provincial debt, debt, debt problem, you know, I think that this is a Chinese privilege that uh, our top leaders, uh, most of them, they have the strong provincial uh, local leader uh, uh, experience. This is, uh, I think, uh, our it's a good tradition, actually. Compare, you know, French uh, election, see? Everybody worried about, not only the French people, but also Europeans worry about. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the leader, if they take part, no any working experience to how to handle with that difficulty. So this is, uh, I think this is a Chinese uh, contribution of the, uh, of the legitimacy from the, your background of the local leader, and then to be uh, mm -hmm. choose from the reality, what it can, you can work or not. Not just the election. Mm -hmm. Maybe people emotionally was followed. Some people, you know, arrogant to speak, but not necessarily uh, follow the empty talking. About the, the last question about uh, the excellent leaders' heritage. I think the most important heritage of the political reform is Deng Xiaoping setting the turn for the future uh, leadership. So that's the reason, you know, Bojilai, the last chance to run for this uh, top, uh, top nine. Because, as, as uh, Professor Pin said, that uh, 67 is the turn. I, I don't think that you, in the United States, France, or any other country, you have set the turn, 37. And uh, I don't, this is a huge contribution for the China. So it's uh, institutionalized of the Chinese uh, leadership transition. Over the Deng Xiaoping, and, and, and uh, after Deng Xiaoping, and, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao also set the rule that the full transition huh, to give the power to the, the, the young generation fully. Uh, so this is also important. And, uh, we learn the lessons from the, from the, from the, from the, from the previous uh, experience. All right, thank you. Professor Sun? Uh, just, you know, they all answer to specific questions, but uh, I'd like to just talk about, uh, it's a very simple prism you can see all those issues. Is the most important concern of CCP is its survival. And then, you know, the, the writings of uh, Kenneth Riverdale, Susan Shirk, and those scholars who observed the early period of the reform in 70s and 80s, why China started reform? To survive. The CCP wanted to survive after aftermath of Cultural Revolution and all those masses. So they started reform, and once, uh, <coughs> once the reform started, all those policies are basically, you know, to somehow gradual and ad hoc or sometimes you know, <coughs> there is no uh, blueprint, but they, their policy was basically, you know, there is an obsession that they have to survive. Then, from that perspective, whether there will be a further democratization or internal, uh, internal <coughs> democracy or institutionalization, etc., all those issues, you can take the prism of, you know, how Chinese leadership perceive, you know, the, the option for safer survival strategies that if they, they will choose democratic elections if they believe that that is better for their survival. That is, you know, and then the other one is including this uh, Tiananmen Square democratic incidents and et cetera, then CCP understand it very well that uh, not only the, the uh, split of leadership, but also make sure that uh, uh, preventing the formation of oppositional groups. You know? So when they see that these intellectuals and students resisted in public against the CCP, then they co-opted them. In 1990s, actually, there was a great story of CCP co-opting you know, intellectuals and then these emerging, emerging uh, private entrepreneurs, and then when they were unhappy about CCP in, from 2002 and 2003, they co-opted those private entrepreneurs. And that has been their strategy, not necessarily a grand plan, but you know, how to survive in each individual instance or accidents or you know, the changing social relations. So, so whether the, these elders, what, what would be the elders' uh, role in the party? My perspective is this. When, for instance, Hu Jintao, so, you know, this slogan was harmonious society, you know, just filling the gap between rich and poor, urban and rural, etc. If that issue is coming serious in Chinese society, then his voice will be bigger. And then if Chinese economy slow down, then Jiang Zemin, if still survive 10 years later, his voice will be bigger. That is all 
the elders now symbolize a certain kinds of strategy or certain kinds of images, and then elders will survive in the party from in, in that way. Not necessarily, you know, personal connection is important, etc. But they still maintain the legitimacy is the legacy of what they did, and then that will be remain in Chinese society as a as a nostalgia. You know, good old days. That is exactly the same as how Park Geun Hye is popular in Korea because of the nostalgia of Park Jong Hye in 1970s, the high speed economic growth. That many people have that nostalgia. So they will play that, that role eventually. Thank it's you. Not a survival, right. sustainable. All right. Mm -hmm. sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Um, um, please join me in thanking four speakers for giving us the good reason to look more eagerly uh, forward to what's going to happen in China in the second half of 2012.